Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you sing with me just one more time? How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Thank you, Jesus. Remind us of your greatness. As, as we sing this, God, we sing it to you and we sing it unto ourselves, Lord. I just want to pray right now for those of us that feel that what they are up against are, is too great or that their lack is too great and they're feeling weighed down and heavy by those things today. And there's a, a cloud of discouragement hovering over them. And I pray that you would take that thinking and turn it upside down. And instead they would say, how great is my God that what I lack is nothing because I have everything I need in him. How great is my God. So no matter how great the obstacle is that I face right now, no matter whether my life turned out the way that I thought it should have or not, it's nothing because the one who is great is for me. And Father, I pray that the truth of that word would penetrate every heart today and that we would leave God with encouragement trusting that you're with us, trusting that you go before us, trusting that you are for us. And God, that we are your church and we are your children and we are victorious, Father God. God, I pray that you would rise up within us, Lord God. Fresh faith and fire and passion. God, to, to live the way you've called us to live. You have come to give us life and life more abundantly. And Father, I pray we'd step into that. We'd stop looking at the things that we think are in the way and instead we would look to you who makes a way where there is no way. In Jesus' name, amen. If you needed to hear that this morning, just say amen. All right, you can be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you, worship team, for doing such a great job leading us into the presence of Jesus. Let's give it up for our worship team this morning. We got kind of a, a new mix up here, and it's great to see um, our younger leaders having a chance to uh, really take ownership and, and take the lead, isn't it? Because that's what it's all about. Here at The Fountain, we're about developing others and connecting them to their purpose. And so uh, we're seeing that happen uh, right before us, right before our eyes this morning. Welcome, we are in week three of circling the wagons, circle the wagons. We are stepping into a new season, not just on the calendar, but the Lord is leading us into new territories. And uh, we've been reminding ourselves that um, as we move forward into God's will, into his beautiful destiny for this church and for our lives as individuals, that we're going to be crossing into enemy territory. Amen? Right? Because we're taking back ground. See, this church isn't here at 1119 East Hearn Road so that we can just do church. We're not here so that we can take up space. We're here to shine the light of his glory into the darkest areas of our life. And so we can't go sleepwalking into 2023, can we? We need to wake up, amen? We need to circle the wagons. We need to make sure that we don't lose our first love, but we stay madly in love with Jesus and our heart continues to break for those who are lost and we continue to love one another, which is what we're told in scriptures, what's gonna make us identifiable 
as God's disciples, as Jesus' disciples, the way that we love one another. And today, I want to talk to you about persistence, and I want to challenge you to never give up. Anybody facing a little bit of discouragement this morning and you're willing to be honest and just acknowledge it? Yeah, I'm a little discouraged. Oh, amen. I knew I was preaching the right message this morning. Maybe something's weighing you heavy down. Maybe you're, you're a little disappointed. And, and, you know, there's times and seasons in your life where you're tempted to quit, isn't it? Isn't there? Right? And, the, and then there's, there's other seasons where when you're just about to quit, something rises up within you that just won't let you do it. Oh, it was about 2004, I think, in Texas uh, when I was in college that I was in the gym working out. Um, I believe it was my senior uh, year of football at Sagu, and I was doing this intense upper body workout. I was doing something called burnouts. Anybody ever do burnouts before? They hurt. And I was, I was on the curl bar, and you know, you start, it's opposite of what you usually do. You start with really heavy weight, you do a few reps, and then you take some weights off, and you do even more reps, then you take some weights, and you finish with just the bar, and you go until you can't go anymore. And I'm in this intense workout, and I get a phone call on my phone. Uh, that's how you call people on a phone, right? And I answer it in the middle of the workout. And it's a friend of mine. And um, they're saying, hey, uh, we're going to the lake. We want to know if you wanted to come. And uh, they just kind of threw in there, April's coming. Now, April was a girl I had a major crush on in college. And so I said, I'm there. Enough said. So I show up after this uh, workout, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, because, you know, I was still a little carnal, in some ways, like I'm going to take off my shirt. I'm going to show this girl my physique after I just worked out, right? You know, just being honest, okay? I was there to impress. You ever try to impress somebody, right, that you had a crush on? And so I was trying to impress. And so we got there, and uh, we walked up to a dock. And first of all, you're not supposed to swim at this lake. There's signs everywhere, no swimming. Uh, in other words, the water's kind of dirty, not healthy place to be swimming, but uh, we decided we were going to swim anyway. And uh, one of the girls had an idea. Let's swim to the middle of the lake because in the middle of the lake is an island. Now, that island, I looked, it was really far. And I'm not a strong swimmer, never have been. And I don't float, I sink. Okay? And so I'm thinking, yeah, that's right, Monica. It's because I'm so muscular, right? Just so lean and so muscular, right? So I just sink like a rock. Muscle doesn't float. What can I say? And um, at first I said, that's kind of far, isn't it? Well, the girl that I liked said, that's not far. I swim there all the time. <sighs> so I was faced with a, a tough decision because uh, my arms felt like noodles arriving to the lake. But I'm like, I can't punk out right now. I like this girl. I'm trying to impress her. And so I agreed to swim to the middle of the island. And so we began to take off and you know, about uh, 20 yards into the swim, uh, this girl that I liked um, thought that uh, it would be fun to ride on my back, and she would just take a ride. So she gets on my back, and I'm swimming. I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, I'm going to drown. But I don't want to say anything because I'm trying to impress her. And so I keep swimming. Finally, I'm like, uh, okay, actually, I'm getting a little bit tired. You think you could hop off? And she's like, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. So she hops off. We get there. We are over halfway to the island. And suddenly a thought pops into my mind. If I swim all the way to that island, I'm never coming back again. And although the island was closer than the dock, I decided to turn around. I said, guys, I'm sorry. I'm tired. I'm heading back to the dock. And they said, okay. Started to swim back. And suddenly I realized that there was a little bit of a current and it felt like I wasn't going anywhere. And on top of that, my arms were just about to fall off. I mean, they were just noodles. You know, when you start to swim and, and it looks like this at first and then it kind of turns to this, right? <laughs> Nothing left in the upper body. And so I'm just kicking as hard as I can. And it gets to the point where I'm starting to have a hard time keeping my mouth above water. And I am drastically out of breath, extremely fatigued. And the water was choppy. And so it's splashing into my mouth. Remember the no swim signs? Now I'm starting to drink this water. 
And I'm starting to feel sick on top of it, just getting just bloated. And so I'm fighting for my life, I realize. Suddenly, my arms go completely limp. It's, it's as if I can't even move them anymore. And I'm going underneath again and again. People always ask, why didn't you just try to float on your back? Oh, I did. And every time I would try to float on my back, first of all, my backside would sink. And then splashes of water would get into my mouth and I would, co- I would cough and I would choke. And so um, I'm really struggling. And as hard as I'm fighting, I keep looking at it. It doesn't look like the shore or the dock is getting any closer. Really began to panic until finally one of the girls that was with us, she stayed behind. She didn't want to get in. She stayed on the dock. And so I called out to her. I had to humble myself. And I said, I can't move. I'm not making any progress. Can you please jump in and just help pull me a little bit? I got nothing left. And she's like, no, no, you can do it. Come on. just." Get. She turns into a cheerleader, which is exactly what I needed right there, right? This is a cheerleader. Come on, no, just keep kicking. Come on, keep pushing. You got it. And I was like, no, I can't do it anymore. Please, would you please just jump in and just pull me a little bit? And what she said to me will ring in my mind for the rest of my life. She said, no, I don't want to get wet. No joke. I quote, I don't want to get wet. Finally, it got to a point where I was so exhausted, I literally thought I had nothing left. And I thought, you know, if I let myself go under, would it be fast? Would it, be, would it end quickly? It was just a fleeting thought, but my head went under, and all of a sudden, something that I thought wasn't there rose up within me that said to keep fighting and to keep kicking. I got back to the surface again, and, and I remember praying to God. I was like, God, I'm going to give this one last push to the dock. I know it's all I have left. After that, I guess I'm coming to see you. Really thought I was going to die. Didn't think a grown man could drown <laughs> like that, but I really thought I was going to die. And so what I did is I turned backwards, tried to get on my back, and I kicked with all the fury I could muster up as hard as I could. And as I'm looking to the side, it feels like I'm going nowhere. And I ran out of gas. Kind of popped up straight again, and I said to myself, this is it. And I turn around, and the dock is right there. But listen, I was so exhausted that I couldn't even get my arm out of the water to grab onto the dock. So I finally got this hero of a woman to reach her hand down and take my arm. I had to hang on the dock for what felt like 10 minutes just to gain enough strength with her help to pull myself up onto it. And when I finally got up, I remember rolling over on my back and just rolling over felt like the most difficult thing in the whole world. You ever um, wake up really tired or maybe really sick and you say, I feel like I weigh a thousand pounds. You ever had that sensation? That's exactly what it was like. I was so fatigued. I felt like I weighed a thousand pounds and could barely move. I laid there uh, just out of breath, panting for a long time, must have been 10, 20 minutes before I was able to recover enough to sit up. Well, finally, my friends who were on the island, they ran into some jet skiers, which would have been nice a few minutes earlier, who gave them a ride back because they too were very exhausted and intimidated to return to the dock on their own. And when they got to the back, when they got back to the dock, they found out what had happened and Let's just say they didn't hang out with that girl (laughs) anymore. And they were very frustrated that she wouldn't jump in and help me. But I learned some things from that experience. Number one, how was I able to push through and beyond what I thought I was capable of? I'm serious. I thought I had nothing left. But I discovered that there was more. Well, quite simply, in a situation that's life or death, quitting just isn't an option. And even though for a moment I told myself it was, there was an instinct that kicked in and said no. You know, in the same way, God has put his Holy Spirit in us to equip us to do what he has called us to do. 
And when it comes to a time where we want to quit, if we'll lean into him, then he'll rise up within us and remind us that quitting is not an option and he will sustain us even beyond what we thought we could ever do. And at the same time, all around the world, there are Christians that are facing some serious opposition right now today, aren't there? I, I subscribe to the, the, the uh, Voice of the Martyrs ma- magazine, and I read incredible stories of men and women of faith that are enduring such uh, horrible persecution. And it's so inspiring Yet most of us have never experienced that type of persecution, have we? But let's be real. There's times when life gets hard. And the temptation to quit, it's real. As God's church, we have to adopt a never quit mentality. Never. It's never an option. It's something that I talk about in pre-marriage counseling They're like, if divorce is an option in the back of your mind, you've set yourself up for failure in a marriage. When it comes to following Jesus, if quitting is an option in the back of your mind, you're going to revert to that thought every time it gets hard. As Joshua said, choose this day who you will serve. He wanted them to make the decision ahead of time so that when things got hard, enough said, I've already made my choice. In Hebrews 12, chapter 3 and or chapter or verse 3 through 4, it says, Think of all the hostility Jesus endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. But here's something else I want you to consider: that unfortunately, I think many of us are a lot more like the girl on the dock. Because we're so consumed with self and how things affect us that we find ourselves sitting back watching a world drown because we don't want to get wet. But there is a great reward for those who endure and those who refuse to quit. See, we need to understand, church, that every day is a life and death situation that eternity hangs in the balance. And as we head into this new year, we must have a mentality that we will not quit no matter what. And that through Christ, we are victorious, not because of us. Yes, you are not enough. Yes, you lack the strength. Maybe you lack the giftings and the abilities, but through Christ, you are more than conquerors. And so as we dive into this, I want to open up with a discussion question at your table. When things get hard, how do you overcome the desire to give up on what God has called you to do? So when you face discouragement, uh, when you've been beaten down by life, when maybe it looks like what you're doing isn't even making a difference, what have you done and what will you do to keep yourself from giving up and keep fighting on? So let's take some time to discuss that, and then we're going to get into the Word. All right. Good discussion, everyone. So this morning, my prayer is that you'll recognize that you're in a life and death situation and you'll make a decision today to never quit. And that's my main point for the message today. Don't quit. Might sound elementary. Sometimes we need to hear it. Sometimes the key is the Holy Spirit's got to help it get from here down to here. Amen? So, before we open up the Word of God, I want to invite you to stand with me with your Bibles. And we are going to do something that's going to help us get the truth from our head down into our heart. And we're going to make a faith statement reminding us of what this is that we hold in our hands today. It has the power to do amazing things in our lives. So if you'll read along with me, one, two, three. This is my Bible. It is God's word. If I read it and live it, I will become everything it says that I am. Do you believe that? 
Amen. Okay. So go ahead and remain standing. Okay, we're going to read this together. Starting in verse, uh, Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 8. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. It's a really fun word to say, isn't it? Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering. Somebody say, he knows. And your poverty. But you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts and you would lift the dark cloud of discouragement over the heads of many. Those that came in here feeling heavy, God, either weary from doing your work or just life has beat them down. I pray, Father God, for a breakthrough in Jesus' name that you would restore hope and faith and expectation to their life again today. And I declare victory over their life, victory over their situation and and, and over their trials right now today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This message is from the first and the last. Let me tell you a little bit about Smyrna. There is some incredible parallels, some connections uh, between Smyrna and the life of Christ. And there's some themes that I believe Jesus is trying to pull out to get their attention. Have you ever had a situation in your life where God supernaturally just connected the dots for you? And he made sense of your situation. Did that not change everything? It's amazing how your perspective changes. You can be right in the thick of it, in the midst of the trial and the heaviness and the weariness and and the problem that's in front of you, it's still there. But suddenly he gives you this divine perspective. And before your situation even changes, your attitude changes and your, cha- your, your thought life changes. And that's what I believe God wants to do in your life today. See, Smyrna uh, owned the exclusive rights, this is interesting, for the import and export of the fragrant spice myrrh. It's in the name, Smyrna. Isn't that crazy? And so uh, myrrh was a spice that was used in the burial process. Myrrh was also, if you read your Bible, you remember that myrrh was something that the wise men brought to Jesus after he was born when they came to see him. So think about this. Myrrh that was used to prepare Jesus' body, since they owned the rights of the import and export, probably came from Smyrna. That's quite a connection to have to the Savior, right? And also we see that myrrh was present at the beginning of his life and at the end of his life. And he opens up by saying this message is from the one who is the first and the last. Perhaps it was for this reason that Jesus camps on this theme that Christians who just may face death, which is associated with this spice that they export and import, will be resurrected to eternal life. That not even death can rob you of the hope that you have. Whatever you're facing today, 
It probably falls short of death. And so you have reason to take courage and continue on. He goes on to say it's a message from the one who was dead but is now alive. See, before each of these letters, he introduces himself in a different way to every church. Because God has to reveal himself to us the way that we need to see him how, in a way that it relates to the situation that we face. And so what he's saying here is what I'm about to tell you and the hope that I'm about to speak over you comes from the very one who defeated death for you, who stared death in the face and overcame. So perk up your ears. Take courage in your heart. Understand who it is that is speaking to you because I have overcome it all. See, Smyrna was a city that also experienced a sort of death and resurrection. Around 600 BC, Smyrna was conquered and completely devastated until it was reduced to nothing but a tiny little village. And suddenly, a man you may have heard of came along by the name of Alexander the Great. And he had a vision to restore this city and make it uh, a beautiful city that would, people would travel from all over to come and see and be a part of. And, and he was a part of the resurrection of this city. And so written in all the folklore and all the literature, it was filled with references to death and resurrection. And so this was like a poetic theme that was a part of Smyrna. It was a part of their DNA that they were used to hearing. And so Jesus is wanting to tap into this. He's saying, look, you have within you resurrection life. And you understand resurrection in a unique way that other people don't. And perhaps that's why I've chosen you to go through these difficult times. Is because I know within you, you have what it takes. Not only are you enough because of me, but I believe in you. There's a, there's a, believe, a belief in the church of Smyrna that, that they can overcome. Because people would say to themselves about that city, we are the city who was once dead and have now come to life. Resurrection was in their culture. Sometimes when we face discouragement, we forget who we really are. And it can change our culture. So the one who defeated death tells them not to fear it. Because he's already been there and he's already done that. And he lives to talk about it. And so this gives courage to not only carry on, but with confidence. Think about it. I believe that this morning, if you're facing discouragement or weariness or the weight of the world just seems like too much to bear, not only does God want to say to you, hold on, but he wants you to understand that in him you can have the confidence to walk through it as a victor with your chest puffed out and all confident. Like, bring it on, devil, because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And if Jesus Christ could conquer death, there's nothing you can throw at me that hasn't already been conquered. And I believe that God wants some of you to rise up with that faith in the midst of your suffering. He opens up in verse 9 the way that he does in all these letters. He says, I know he says, I know about your suffering and your poverty, but, but let's focus on those words one more time. I know. Because not only did Jesus know, not only was he vaguely aware of what they were going through, but he was intensely aware. Not only did he understand and, and, and see that they were suffering, but he himself suffered. And so he empathized with them. When encouragement comes from someone who has been where you are, it carries so much more weight. It's so important that we know in the heart of our hearts that when we're struggling, and it just seems like so much, and why would God allow me to face all this? Why, why, why is everything just so heavy? But when you know that the one who has suffered more than you could ever think or imagine is the one encouraging you to keep going on, 
you can have a confidence that rises up even before your circumstances change. So he was intensely aware, and he would never forget. Later on in Revelation, we see it come to pass that he will actually avenge those that have suffered and been martyred for him. He's going to take care of it. He's going to make it right. Whatever it is you're facing right now, if you're, if you're following him and you're remaining faithful to him, guess what? As messed up as it is, he's going to make it right. I don't know when, but he's going to make it right. He says, I know about your suffering and your poverty. Now check this out. That word suffering is a term that was used to describe an ancient type of torture where they would take the victim and lay him on his back and they would place heavy boulders or weights on top of his chest. And maybe they'd come and then they'd stack another weight. And they'd come and stack another weight and slowly the chest would begin to cave in. They would labor to breathe and they would not be able to catch their wind until finally all the life and the wind is crushed out of them. Now, as gruesome as that sounds, have you ever felt that way emotionally? Like the walls were closing in? Are some of you carrying that today? Where you just look at what you're facing, what your family's going through, what you're going through, or someone you love is going through right now, and it just seems overwhelming. And you don't think you have what it takes to bear it anymore. See, there were three types of weights that this church was carrying. And Jesus describes them as poverty. He says blasphemy, which the word actually is a lot closer to what you would think of when you think of slander. And imprisonment. And for some of those, that imprisonment meant death. So those are some pretty heavy weights to carry, right? Right? How many of you are thankful that you're not the church in Smyrna today, right? Now, you've got weights on you, but luckily you're not facing some of these things. So he addresses them one by one. First, he addresses their poverty. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you didn't have enough? Have you ever used the term, if only? (laughs) If only I had this, then things would be better. Or if only this person would do that, then it wouldn't be so bad. It's just that feeling of lack. And we can carry that whether uh, whether it's something financial or whether we just feel like we're not enough. And so how were they poor? He talks about poverty. How were they poor? Why was the church of Smyrna so poor? Well, some of it was a result of that second weight, the slander. The people would shun them and refuse to do business with them because of who they were. Because they were Christians. I don't know if any of you have experienced that type of persecution in in your faith. That because they find out you're a Christian, they don't want to do business with you. To the point where it actually affects your ability to take care of yourself. But this is what was happening. They were were put out of the synagogue and they were an outcast. and, And so they suffered because it was difficult just to scrape by at times. Can you imagine being a church... And, and, and believing that God had called you to shine the light and, and fulfill this great commission, but feeling like you barely have what it takes to keep going. And yet the mission doesn't change. But what does Jesus say to them? He says, you are rich. What are you talking about, God? How are we rich? We need to remember what we have. When the feeling of lack comes, when you feel like you're not enough, you need to remember what you have. Because what they had is what made them rich. But what made them poor was being focused on what they did not have. Because if you focus on what you do not have, then what you do is you cripple yourself and you rob yourself of any ability to have any joy, any encouragement to get through any difficult thing that comes your way. And you find yourself playing this waiting game. One day, when this happens to me, then things will be better. One way when uh, we get enough 
um, income, then things will be better. And so we sit there passive and we become the girl on the dock just waiting for something to happen, someone else to do something about it. See, they were all too aware of what they did not have, but they forgot or underestimated what they did have. See, they were rich because when you find yourself in a situation of lack, there's nothing else you can do but lean on Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing. It's in the times of lack that you're reminded of what really matters and what it truly means to be rich. But when we become rich, we often forget what it means to be rich and we find ourselves poor. He says he addresses uh, another church and we're going to hit this in depth later on. But in Revelation 3, 17, he addresses another church that had a bigger problem than they had. See, they had the problem of poverty, but listen to what he says to this church in Revelation 3.17. He says, you say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And so you see, he tells the poor that they're rich and he tells the rich that they're poor. What is he trying to communicate? What point is he trying to get across here is that you can fall into a trap of thinking that you don't have enough. And when you have this this mentality of scarcity, it leads to inactivity. And we just walk around complaining and waiting for something to just happen. But if God gave Smyrna a mission, why would he not provide the resources first before he gave him the mission? Or is it possible that Smyrna already had everything they needed to be the church he called them to be? I gotta admit, I found myself over the last few years living from August to August See, our elders know that joke. That's why they're laughing. Because we are in a stepladder lease with our school here. And for the first three years, every August, there's a, a pretty big increase in what they pay for rent. And it can be tempting to just be like, you know what? When August hits, then we'll be able to address this. Then we'll be able to hire this person. And then things are going to shift and things are going to change in this church. But I believe what God has been speaking to me about our church is right now, Fountain of Life has everything it needs right now. That our ministry is fully funded and fully staffed and that everything that we need to be the church God has called us to be is in the building right now. Otherwise, he wouldn't have called us. We are rich. And the fact that we can't just go out and and hire professionals to take us to the next level, the fact that we can't go out and just dump a bunch of money in this building because if you build it, they will come, is such an incredible blessing. Because the moment we begin to depend on those other things, the moment we truly become poor, the moment that idols rise up above us, the, more, the moment that causes us to take a, our eyes off the true prize. Everything we need to accomplish the mission has already been given to us. And you know what? If we were suddenly able, I, on, I gotta be honest, like, I don't wanna discourage anybody in here if you're thinking about right now, right, right now like a million dollar check or something like that, you know, and the Lord leads you to do that, go ahead and do that. But sometimes I think, what would happen if $10 million just fell in our lap? How would we respond? Could that be a bad thing? Because now suddenly we're breathing a sigh of relief. And now all of a sudden we're enthusiastic about the future again. Because a check was written. But where was that enthusiasm before when Jesus was all you had? Because he's all we need. 
See, when he said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he wasn't saying, because I'm going to give you tons of resources and you're going to begin, begin to use the tools of the world to uh, save the world. He's saying, though, that in spite of what you don't have, I am going to be more than enough. Man, what would happen? I don't want to see that happen. I want to see us move forward and refuse to quit and give it our best right now in this season. And this is why we need to circle the wagons. We need to be reminded that we are rich today. We need to be reminded that God is more than enough and that we can move forward with confidence. We need to get to a point where every day we come to church, we come with expectation that, that you came in, you rolled in the parking lot this morning anticipating that you were gonna experience God and that he was gonna touch your heart and something was gonna shift in the spiritual realm and you're gonna leave this place different than the way you came in. There is no reason why we can't have that much expectation on a Sunday every single week. It doesn't matter who's here or who's out. It doesn't matter if the pastor's preaching or if there's a guest speaker. Every single day we have everything we need to experience all that God has for us. He's just looking for a church that's ready to be blessed. He's just looking for a church that's going to position themselves and put them in a place where he can reach out and he can touch and he can bless what's going on there. But we need to remember that we're rich. We lack nothing Hallelujah. Can we just give God some praise for that? Come on. We lack nothing. We've got everything we need. He goes on to say, I know the blasphemy that the so-called Jews are speaking. See, what was happening is they were slandering them. They were saying things that were not true about the church you heard a little bit last week about the church in Ephesus and just the pagan uh, temple of Artemis and all that. Remember, and just talking about how sinful and how wicked and evil the culture, the pagan culture was around them. Well, the Jews wanted to not only separate themselves from the pagan culture, but they wanted to be separated from these Christians as well. And so they began to say things about them that weren't true. First of all, they kicked the Christians out of the synagogue. And so by doing that, they kind of became sort of a despised subculture already. But then they begin to accuse them think, of things like this. They begin to say that they were cannibals because they claimed to eat the flesh of, of Christ and drink the blood of Christ in their worship. And so they called them cannibals. Well, who wants to associate with a cannibal, right? Who wants to do business with someone who eats human flesh? Sounds pretty sick and twisted. They claimed that they were doing some of the same things that we were talking about the, uh, the um, pagans in Ephesus were doing. That they were having just these massive parties and orgies as a part of their worship service. I mean, just, this is hardcore accusations that are completely baseless. And because they called each other brother and sister, they said that meant that they were anti-family. And they didn't care about their family. They only cared about each other. So they became this despised subculture on the outside. And so here they are. They're feeling poor. They're feeling like outcasts. What do we do? Do we see some of the slander today? Maybe not to that extreme, but have you ever encountered a situation where um, you hesitated to mention that you were a Christian because you know all the labels that come along with it? That depending on who you're talking to, Christian might mean homophobic, misogynistic, uh, anti-women's rights, whatever it is. And so you kind of leave that part out. Nowhere near the level of what they experience, but sometimes we can be passive in situations because we're concerned about the weight of slander or reputation. But he says... The way they can overcome this weight. He's pointing out that they say they're Jews, but they're not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. In other words, what Jesus is saying is when you hear of all the terrible things that are being said about you, 
Consider the source. Consider the source. Sometimes we care way too much about what's being said by people who are of no consequence to us. They have no authority over us. They have no power over us. And frankly, they're blind. So Jesus is saying, this is what they're saying about you, but this is what I say, or rather, this is what the I am says about you. We've spent a lot of time uh, this past um, fall talking about which voice you're listening to. Because there's two voices. Sometimes it comes through another person. Sometimes it comes in the form of a thought. But you're either listening to the truth of God's voice or you're listening to Satan. Consider the source because he's the, Jesus is the first and the last. He was dead and now alive. And so there's no one like our God. How great is our God, right? Well, if we believe that, then when, we, when he speaks, we need to listen. And we need to receive it and we need to take it to heart. But when others speak negatively about us that don't know what they're talking about, you decide how much power they have over you. You decide what kind of emotion you're going to attach to what they're saying. You decide how you're going to view it and how you're going to look at it. It's the spiritually blind that slander you and give God's church a bad name. It's, it'd be like a blind person calling you ugly. Like, no offense against blind people, but you don't know if I'm ugly. They don't know what God knows. And when you're slandered, it should not come as a surprise, should it? It should be worn like a badge of honor. I felt like that was one of the biggest changes that took place in my life as a young Christian is when I fully surrendered to his will and I just started to burn for him. One of the first things I noticed is I did not care about anybody's opinion. And when I would share Jesus with someone and they would mock me and make fun of me, I smiled. Because I'm like, this is so cool. Like, I get to be slandered for his name's sake. The fact that I'm being made fun of shows that God saw me of worthy of suffering for him. Even if it's just a small thing. Man, they spit on him. They mocked him. They hit him. This is nothing. And it just gave me this confidence in the midst of it. And it confirmed that I was doing the right thing. It says in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Jesus said, God blesses you when people mock you. Have you ever stopped to think that when people are spreading rumors, it's a sign that God's blessing is upon you? And persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. That last line is pretty significant, isn't it? You're in good company. When you're being mocked or when rumors are being started because of who you are in Christ, you're in good company. You're surrounded by a, a host of great witnesses, as it says in Hebrews. When you understand what it means to be slandered because of Jesus, you can actually gain encouragement from it. Instead of becoming discouraged, you can be like, look, I'm on the right track. I'm ticking off the devil. <laughs> it's on the head in the right way. Now, on the flip side of this, Jesus says in Luke 6, 26, what sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds for their ancestors also praised false prophets. If the world's only speaking well of you, you may not be doing something right. Because if you follow Jesus closely, you're going to upset some people. Amen? So he goes on in verse 10 to say, don't be afraid for what you are about to suffer. Now that could be a very uh, discouraging statement for some. About to suffer. 
You know, usually when someone says, don't be afraid, I recall uh, comforting my children when they're scared at night, right? If there's a thunderstorm. And what do I use to comfort them? I say, don't be afraid. It's just noise. It can't hurt you. What I'm telling them is they don't need to be afraid because nothing bad is going to happen. But here where Jesus is saying, don't be afraid, he's saying something bad is bound to happen. It's inevitable. I wish I could tell you something different. I wish I could tell you that, man, if you give your life to Jesus and you live for him, that the result of that is you're just going to have peace in every area of your life. I wish I could tell you that. I, w- I wish I could just be the bearer of good news today that, you know what, like things are just going to get better all the time and it's going to be like Disneyland every day and all your problems are going to go away. All you got to do is surrender your heart to Jesus. Well, there's a gospel that's being preached today that goes a little bit like that, but it's deception. And it either leads to someone whose relationship with Jesus is completely shallow or at least to deep discouragement. It's a false gospel. In reality, it's sometimes because you're serving Jesus that things get hard and the persecution comes. Sometimes when you're doing everything right, it's when the enemy comes and hits you the hardest. But we can't give up. See, it would lead to imprisonment for many of them, and to some of them they would even face death. But it says here that they would be put into prison for 10 days. Does that throw anybody else off? It's like, wait, is he serious? Like, he already knows exactly like, what their sentence is going to be? Like, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, I can live in a prison for 10 days. Now, see, what's actually happening here is 10 days is a metaphor for a short time. You know, it's, 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 it's like saying, you'll suffer for a moment, but, but what Paul, or not Paul, sorry, what John, through Jesus, is declaring here is that all suffering is temporary. It's one of those statements that can sound so elementary that we just gloss over it. But it's a mentality that we need to take upon ourselves. And we need to be reminded that whatever that is that you're facing right now, that it seems to be no end in sight and no way out, there's an expiration date on it. Come on, somebody. It's not going to last forever. There's an expiration date on your suffering, but you know what does not have an expiration date? The hope that you have been given in Christ Jesus. The hope that you have will forever outlast whatever obstacle you face, whatever weight you carry. He says, if you remain faithful, even when facing death. This is heavy stuff. Facing death? Are you serious? You want me to be faithful even when facing death? See, Jesus is saying quitting is simply not an option. Because if death facing you isn't enough to get you to stop, then nothing is. That's determination. Do you think Jesus was able to endure the cross thinking that "Mm, at some point if it gets too hard, I'll just hop off? Do you think he would have been able to get through that if he had that in the back of his mind? The one who's telling you to not shrink back from death is the one that made a decision long before any of you, you of us who are here to lay down his life. He made a decision that he was willing to do whatever it takes. And because of that, you have hope regardless of what you face today, regardless of if, if you feel the warm and fuzzies or not. You have hope. Don't give up. Remain faithful even when facing death. And to those who stay faithful, he makes a promise. He says, I will give you the crown of life. I'd like to invite the worship team back up as we close. When you hear that statement, I will give you the crown of life, 
Do you know what Jesus wants you to know today? No matter how hard it gets, no matter how heavy it feels, you need to understand something right now. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. And you, and you might be in a situation right now, you're like, this is really bad. This better be some prize. Well, let me tell you, it is. There's nothing you could face that could compare with the hope that you have. It's going to be worth it. See, this, this mentality and this focus is often the biggest key to get us through tough times. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, if you read history, you'll find that Christians who did most for this present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. You tracking with them here? It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, and we're talking about heaven, right? That they have become so ineffective in this. Where's your mind today? Where's your focus? Are you focusing on everything that's against you? Are you caught up in the emotion or the lack of emotion that you feel? The enthusiasm or the lack of enthusiasm that you feel? Are you caught up in looking at the circumstances around you and just feeling disappointed because you thought it would be different? Sometimes we just need to change our focus to what lies ahead. Every believer should be the ultimate eternal optimist. There's always a reason to be thankful. There's always a reason to press on. And he closes this letter to the church the way he closes similarly all the other letters. He says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. And I just want to pause there and say that God is speaking to you right now. But you got to have ears to hear. You need to lean in and allow him to whisper to you what you need to hear, the truth about your situation. And remember that he is for you, not against you. And if he's for you, who can ever be against you? And it's not about the feelings you feel. It's not about whether you feel tired and weary or whether you can see the fruit or the results of your labor. But he is for you. And then he says, whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. See, see death is something it's not something that we should fear. It's been a, appointed to each and every one of us to live but to, to die. It's happening. It's inevitable. But it's the second death that we should fear. And we're promised here that the second death cannot harm us. Just remain faithful. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to talk about one more thing real quick as we close. Not only is it worth it, but it's worth everything that you have. This weekend, Orlando and I were up in Prescott at a, a leadership summit. And one of the things we heard about was something called the quiet quit. And the quiet quit is called the quiet quit because you don't actually quit quit, but you sort of back off and you stop giving it your all. It's that moment when discouragement sets in so much that you lose all expectation. And the enemy starts to say stuff to you like, you know what, this isn't gonna make a difference anyway. Like, are you really gonna put yourself all out there knowing it's not gonna be reciprocated, knowing it's not gonna be appreciated? They're not even listening. So we quiet quit. 
We go through the motions. We keep showing up. But we have no anticipation that anything of significance is going to take place. And I just want to invite you, if you have quiet quit this morning, to wake up out of that, to, to re-give your all and to rededicate your all to him. Because if you'll continue to pour yourself out, he'll continue to pour himself in. He's faithful. That extra effort that you've been holding back in your service, you've been holding back from your family, you've been holding back in the workplace, makes all the difference in the world. It is so significant. Do not discount it. The little extra things that you do matter so much to him. Give him your all. So when you feel like you don't have what it takes, remember what you have in him. When a voice is filling your head with lies, consider the source. And when you're suffering, remember that it's temporary. It's going to pass. Stay faithful. And remember that no matter how bad it gets, it's worth it. Stay faithful. Because breakthrough is coming. Amen. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray over your church. And I know that there are some that what they carry is so heavy, it's overwhelming to the point where they can feel it physically. Some of you in here, you've, you've had moments of shortness of breath because the level of anxiety that's been turned up on your life. And you're being set free from that this morning in Jesus' name. And he's giving you peace. And as you lean into him, he's going to fill you. He's going to sustain you. And as you realize he's for you, not only will you make it, but you will thrive in the midst of the storm. In Jesus' name, I declare that over this church, God. God, I pray for those who have quietly quit have begun to come through, go through the motions. Maybe it's in their relationship with you and they've, they've just gone through the motions because they know they're supposed, they're supposed to, but they're just not giving you their all because they're afraid they're going to be let down. And Father, I pray, God, that they would just surrender their everything and that you would pour out and you would refresh them today. And Father, awaken your church to... Be resolute in this. That we recognize that eternity hangs in the balance and we recognize, uh, Lord, that this is a life and death situation and when I feel like quitting, that I believe that your Holy Spirit is gonna rise up within me and give me what it takes to continue on, to push further beyond and past what I ever thought I was capable of. And we lean on you today. We rededicate our hearts to you today. And we take hold of hope once again. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to invite and give an invitation to you this morning uh, to come to the front if you need prayer. Anyone feeling heavy today, feeling the weight of the world, you're just like, man, I would love it if someone would just put a hand on my shoulder and just pray over me because I, I don't want to carry this anymore. So the team is going to lead us into a prayerful atmosphere. And I'd like to invite table hosts and elders to put your arm around this person who's dealing with this heavy weight. But would you just acknowledge that this morning, that you're needing a touch from God by coming to the front. And we will be available to pray with you this morning. Amen. So please come now for prayer. Trembles at his voice.
Jesus. I just feel like, I just feel like there's somebody, he just, you just feel like you don't have the strength to come to the front. But you could really use prayer. If that's you, could you just lift up your hand or maybe if just reach out to someone at your table, reach out to your table host and say, would you just pray with me? There's nothing magical about the front. If you don't want to come down here, but you know you need prayer, I just invite you to open up to your table host and just, and just take some time and pray with them because I know that if you came in here feeling heavy, there's no reason for you to leave feeling the same way. That he's got something for you. He's got something that he wants to impart unto you. So I just challenge you, reach out to that table host. Maybe you're a table host right here. You already know who that person is and you don't need to ask permission. Just go put a hand on their shoulder and just begin to pray with them. Come on, let's give God a few more moments to minister to us. Would you all just lift your hands with us as we sing um, Mighty to Save. Sing that chorus this morning. Just lift your hands and your voices to him today. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's sing Savior. God is mighty to save. He is 
mighty to stay forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Father, we worship you and we thank you, God, that the victory is yours, that you go before us, Father. And I pray, God, that we would leave today with that confidence, Lord Jesus, that we would be encouraged in our hearts, God, for greater things are ahead. The best is yet to come. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, you guys have a wonderful day. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Uh, Go in the presence of God and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Love you guys.